You're listening to The Sound of Pursuit. I'm Hal Humphreys. And I'm John Nardizi. John, it's good to see you again. I was um, I was out last week with a little bout of COVID, which was my yeah. very first experience with that. And I have to say, I don't want to do it again. Yep. I had the same thing happen a few weeks ago. Um. It's coming up on conference season. Uh, I, I was out at a conference in California um, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm fairly certain that's where I picked up my uh, loading dose of the COVID virus. Um, so going forward, I'm going to pay real close attention to hand sanitizer uh, and, 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 <laughs> and keeping a little bit of a social distance uh, when I'm at these conferences. Um, yep. you know, sev- several conferences coming up this summer um, around the country. Uh, I'm, I'm planning on attending a couple of them myself. Um, yeah. I, understand, I understand you just got back from a conference last week. I did. I did. And hopefully you and I will run into each other at some of those conferences. But uh, I just came back from the Innocence Network Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. The Innocence Network, um, and I understand that the conference has been around for twenty some odd years. It has, yep. Tell, and it, the, tell me, tell me, what is the Innocence Network? What does that mean? So the Innocence Network started out as an organization that was championing this idea that there were innocent people in prison and they shouldn't be there, as uh, dramatic as that is. So that that was kind of like the early DNA cases that people have heard about. Barry Sheck was a leader in that area, and they actually had a film from the very first conference where you could see about 20 people uh, had had been exonerated over a certain number of years. The conference was very small. They had a dinner like in somebody's house. This conference has grown exponentially. So we had 300 exonerated people, 300, which represented a total of 5,500 years of innocent people in prison. Oh my gosh. Um, their families and families are there attorneys investigators uh, it was it was great powerful yeah one of the one of the things that hits me about innocence cases is there's always a celebration you know once someone is is exonerated um i don't think sometimes there's enough emphasis on the fact that they've been wronged yeah no exactly it's the what they do is the people who are attending in every given year, they introduce them and they stand up and there's a photograph of them and the number of years that they spent in prison. And it's, you know, it's powerful to see and, and you, you know, you cheer your guy on and I had about four clients there and, you know, it's great, great energy. But at the same time, under, underlying that is like a, as the numbers go by, you're like, oh my God, you know, these families that are affected 52 years, 40 years, 22 years, whatever. You know, nobody, it's just, it's, uh, it's emotional. I mean, people are sobbing, people are crying, people are cheering. It's, 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 it's a, it's very like a one of a kind kind of conference. It really is well, something I'm, else. I'm, I'm going to um, put that in my calendar for next year. Cause that sounds amazing. Um, what yeah, um, I, I have an ahead. idea for a, a presentation that we, we got to do. Yeah. So one of the things that, that, that you had mentioned to me earlier, um, before, um, when we were talking about doing this podcast today, uh, was the notion of the number of teams that get together, um, without an investigator at all. Yeah. It was one of the things that's sort of, as I've gotten more involved in the last two or three years in particular with the new England innocence project, which I'm doing a ton of work now for, you know, I'm talking to different people around the country, either they're looking for some help on a case or advice on, on consulting on certain things. And I always had the impression like the basic ground rules are out there. You know, you, you got a legal team, you got a lawyer or maybe two lawyers and you have an investigator and I'm, I'm learning from different people. There's probably like 60 plus innocence networks within the, within, you know, that, that framework of the innocence network, 60 different groups in different legal teams, but some of these legal teams can't find investigators. And there was an attorney who stood up in a class and I give her credit. I'm not knocking this lawyer. I, I didn't quite pick up where she was from, but she got up at the end of an investigation presentation by a group that they did a great job on how to investigate a wrongful conviction and get somebody out of prison who's innocent. But the attorney stood up and said, I, I am having trouble finding 
investigators. We don't have enough investigators. And that echoed about three or four other conversations I've had in the last six months. And Hal, it's incredible. It's like, here it is. The very thing that led to the wrongful conviction oftentimes was a defense attorney who was a bum, who didn't hire an investigator, didn't get a motion for funds, didn't bother doing any investigation. 20 years, 40 years later, whatever it is, you're, I, you're just repeating the same thing. You're repeating the same mistake. You're about to overturn a conviction. You don't have an investigator. I, I was kind of shocking, you know, to, to just hear it from different people. Well, so, is it is it a matter of there's a shortage of investigators willing to do this kind of work? Or is it a matter of attorneys don't know to go looking for them? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that uh, the the attorney that stood up definitely has tried to find investigators and hasn't been happy with some of the people. So that's that's a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of it, I have come across some people who are telling me they're they're approached by these. I would call them maybe a little top heavy with lawyers and they're, you know, they're studying different ways and studying the, the laws that apply to a particular case and sort of waiting for the law to change to get somebody out of prison. And the investigator is asked to come in as sort of, you know, maybe do one interview a year. I mean, it just, and I contrast that with some of the work that I, you know, that I do and I know other investigators and that you do where we're talking to 30, 40 people on one case. You know, the, yeah. it, and that's just the interviews, never mind the court research, the background research or, or weird tasks that, you know, we're, we're good at. I mean, people, you know, I got a request this year. Do you think you can find an intact 1982 Monte Carlo? Uh, because we need to look at it and sign, kind of examine where DNA was was uh, pulled on a, on a particular case. So, you know, that's that's investigator stuff. That's what we do. That's what we, we know how to do. So, I kinda... yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I'm kind of really interested in a intact 1982 Monte Carlo. Those were yeah. cars. <laughs> they were. I remember a lot of good nights uh, with my Monte Carlo back in yeah. the day. It's, it's kind of a sled, long nose on those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, for, for, for the investigators out there that, that think to themselves, gosh, I'd sure like to get into the, uh, into the criminal defense business. I'd like to get some of that work. Look, here's the thing. There are people out there that need um, the work of curious, dogged professional investigators across the country. Um, get out there and meet those people. Um, you know, when yeah. attorneys are having a, a hard time finding um, <clears throat> competent uh, and willing investigators, be that competent and willing investigator. Um, you know, exactly. You're not going to get rich doing this work. Yeah, you're not going to get rich, but I'll tell you, if you really fancy yourself a good investigator, I think most people listening to this podcast are probably really into it. You know, I mean, they're spending their time, they're learning, and, and you know, I know that you're always reading things, and I'm reading things. If you're really into it, the, this field, you will never come across better investigative challenges in these cases. I mean, you're going to be looking for people that are not easy to find. You're going to be talking to people from different areas of life. You're going to get those weird kind of requests where they're like, Hey, you get, we got to go talk to an investigator. So there's nobody who knows how to find this stuff. So it's great stuff. And you know, you can find a way to get paid. I mean, there's funds that exist in the court system, the department of justice. I have some flat out full paying cases where families have stepped forward. You know, the, the brother of the, the person who's in prison is now wealthy and is like, I want to hire you full price, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. you can find ways to, to earn a living and it's, it's phenomenal work. You'll never forget working on one of these cases. The, the, when you work on a case as an investigator, and even if you have a very small part in the process, when that person walks out of prison, a free man or a free woman, it is a, there's no description for the feeling. It just feels like yeah. you've done something good. Um, yeah, exactly. So in, in this, you know, our profession, sometimes when you do, you know, civil work, it can be uh, a little bit like chasing amorphous things and, you know, it's just saving billions or millions for the client. And, th but this is different. This is, you see the body coming out of the prison. You see the, your client walking out of the courtroom with a look on their face of, you know, you, they like, I can actually walk out of here now free. I mean, it's, makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. And, I, uh, talk, I talked to, um, Johnny Lindsay, um, exoneree out in Dallas, Texas. Um, and you know, 
he did his attorney did not hire an investigator in the uh, um, yeah pre conviction phase the pre trial phase uh, and, and Johnny said without hesitation he goes man I believe had I had an investigator we never would have been here um, yeah exactly and how at this conference one of the exonerees came up to me and said exactly that we were talking at the end of, just about to leave for the airport and he said somebody just introduced me and said he's a private investigator that does defense work and he he his eyes kind of lit up he said man good investigators are tough to find if i had somebody like you 30 years ago wouldn't even be here today and and that's the thing you know we the you can't criticize cops and you can't say bad cops and bad prosecutors without talking about bad defense lawyers i mean you know they're a part of the problem and and not having not i mean they're the ones that run the case they need to bring in the specialists you know it's like having three all-star quarterbacks on a football team but no wide receivers or running backs you're not going to win <laughs> yeah. so yeah 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 it needs to um, be done and you know here's the thing there are some absolutely fantastic attorneys out there that will spend the money up front to hire a good investigator and still you get the wrong result or you get a bad result um but if, if nobody's putting an effort in in the beginning um, and then 10, 15, 20 years later, somebody comes along and starts finding a lot of errors, um, starts finding evidence that, that nobody had paid attention to before, um, it's frustrating. But again, yeah, it I, is. The thing about this work um, of criminal defense investigations and, you know, John and I both do criminal defense investigations. We also both do a lot of other kinds of investigations. But this is the reason we keep coming back to this topic is it really does um, have an impact on your life is not just as an investigator, but as a human being to, to be able to to work um, case yeah. by case on things that matter. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Well, John, um, I am, am tickled that we, we've gotten the chance to sit down and chat again. It's been far too long. Um, and are we going to try and do this again next week? Next week looks perfect. So we'll, uh, we'll be back with a sterling new topic and, um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, and I think we're going to see if we might possibly find a guest to join us next week um, for a little bit of the conversation. So, um, well, I, I think that's it. Um, check your calendars. If you're a private investigator out there, check your calendars. Um, check your state organizations. Uh, find out when the next conference is going to be. Sign up for it. Go to it. Network. Meet people. Um, you know, going to conferences are one of the most useful things I have ever done as a private investigator. Um, if you've yeah. never been to a conference, please, please, please check it out. And I would add that sometimes, you know, you're, you're in the conference rooms and you're listening to different talks. And of course that revelation was confirmed that there are not a, enough investigative teams with private investigators, defense investigators. But the other thing too, is it's just those little conversations you have, you know, at the pool table at night or at the bar or whatever, you know, you, you learn things, you hear things that nobody's talking about. So it really is that sort of in-person kind of knowledge that gets imparted. It's just terrific. So innocence network. Check innocence network. Yes, definitely check that out. And, um, you know, you talk about the strange places you have conversations that matter at the Cali conference last year. In Palm Springs, California, um, we had uh, we had a long conversation in the pool at the <laughs> hotel that ended up in, yeah. in two or three people working together on some projects. So, look, that go to a conference. Great. You can have a good time, um, but you can also network and meet some folks. John, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a real quick shout out to one of our sponsors. But um, I'm Hal Humphreys. I'm John Nardizi. And now a quick shout out to our two sponsors. Big thanks to OREB Private Investigator Liability Insurance and investigatormarketing.com.